Good morning, um, everyone. Good afternoon uh, to some of you. Hello and welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm Professor Jennifer Dill and I'm going to be introducing um, today's seminar along with my colleague, Professor Chris Monsier, who will be chiming in in a moment. So our Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. These seminars are usually held live uh, on the Portland State University's urban campus that is located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kailapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, today's seminar will obviously be hosted fully online. Um, and uh, many of you have been joining us for the full term, but for those of you who have not, we have uh, been focusing for this um, term on equity in transportation, uh, recent research and practice. Um, and before I introduce today's speaker, though, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, my colleague, uh, Chris Monsier, is going to chime in for um, a few announcements to the students who are taking this as a course this term. Yeah, so just a reminder that the last, uh, you have two, two things to complete for the course, the last uh, reflection on today's speaker, and then, a, and then a final sort of summary and reflection of the entire, um, you know, of the entire uh, speaker seminar series. So I think many of you have sort of identified some themes that you've, that you've noticed in some of the, in the different talks. And so kind of presenting those uh, to us in a, in a summary um, is what we're looking for for that final reflection. And then we will, because this is a new structure in terms of how we've half the class in terms of finding references and the weekly ref and the reflections due at the after the speaker, uh, we're going to create a short feedback survey and we will offer some um, uh, bonus points. Basically, we'll let you drop uh, another uh, source. Um, if you complete that survey. So watch for that on D2L um, in the next couple of days and uh, be sure to turn in your last couple of assignments by the due dates. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions, um, we may be able to do them at the end or email um, either Professor Monsier or myself. So without Further ado, sorry, I need to advance. Um, I am very happy um, to have with us today Stephen Higashidi. Stephen holds a master's in urban planning and is director of research for the Transit Center, a New York based foundation that works to make cities more sustainable and just through better public transit. He previously worked as a transportation advocate in the New York area, working on winning campaigns for legislation, protecting pedestrians and cyclists and against congressional attempts to defund public transportation. His book, Better Buses, Better Cities, How to Plan, Run, and Win the Fights for Effective Transit was named one of Planetizen's 10 Best Urban Planning Books for 2019, and his writing has also appeared in The New Republic, The Atlantic, and The Los Angeles Times. So uh, before I turn it over to Stephen, I just want to um, give her a refresher or an introduction um, to those of you joining us for the first time um, to some of the features of GoToWebinar. Um, so we will have a recording um, and the slides available um, afterwards. We'll be posting those online and you'll get a link to that uh, in an email following up. And so you can share with your colleagues or watch again. Um, and uh, we, we are approved for one hour of uh, continuing education credits. Um, after the presentation at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes or so for questions. And uh, the way that works is you can type your question into the question box as part of GoTo. Uh, webinar. You can do that at any time during the presentation, but we will save those to the end and um, Chris and I uh, will share them with Stephen and hopefully we'll get through most of them in terms of answering, but we do share them with the speaker afterwards in case we don't get to everything. 
And I think with that, I have covered all of our introduction and we're gonna turn it over to Stephen. Uh, hello, um, just is, uh, can folks hear me? I can we hear can you. Hear I'm not you. seeing oh, a screen. Sorry. That seems like that happened maybe at the, at the worst time. Um, I'm just waiting for the pop-up to, uh, to share. There you go. All right. Yes. Um, thank you, Professor Dill. Uh, you know, this is this is the way we live now, um, unfortunately. Um, so I want to start also by uh, acknowledging. Um, so I'm coming uh, to folks from Cold Spring, New York. Um, these are the lands of the Wappinger and the Muncie Lenape people. Um, I want to thank uh, Portland State for the opportunity. Uh, to speak with you all today. Uh, and I wanna speak about um, why better bus service is a matter of justice and Steven. how- Sorry. Yep. I'm gonna interrupt because we are only, we're missing like the left few inches of your slide. I don't- um... With your screen share, um, it is, not showing your entire screen. Uh, let's see. Let me let me try sharing it again. Um, or if you give me uh, let's see main screen, how's that? Oh, that's yes. much better. That worked. Okay. There we go. Thank Perfect. You. Beautiful. All right. Um, so uh, as I was saying, I want to I want to talk about um, why. Uh, why better bus service is a uh, is a matter of justice, and how we can win the fight and uh, achieve that justice. Um, as Professor Dill mentioned, you know much of this talk is going to be based on uh, stories and research from folks uh, fighting for better bus service uh, in U.S. cities that I conducted for uh, my book, uh, Better Buses, Better Cities. But I actually want to start with a question from another book one that's been very influential in uh, how I think about uh, buses and transit. It comes from the book, uh, Rights in Transit, from the City uh, University of New York professor, Kafui Atto, who asks, you know, what is the place of public transportation in this democracy? Uh, should there be a moral minimum to how we allocate transit? These are questions that situate transit as an issue of justice. And we also have to look at the actual, when we look at the actual experience of bus riders, I think it becomes almost immediately evident that issues of justice are at play here. In normal times before the pandemic, Americans were taking almost 5 billion trips a year on buses. And yet so, many of those trips were abjectly miserable. They involved circuitous commutes, uh, waiting on the side of the road without protection from the weather or from traffic. They might involve waiting for a bus that just didn't come with no real information about uh, when it showed up. Um, these, are, these are serious problems. These are issues of justice and buses are an issue of climate justice. Um, we know that transportation is now the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the US. And when we talk about transportation, decarbonizing it is not going to come from building high-speed rail across the country or new technologies like electrifying planes or ferries. It's going to come from addressing our everyday transportation issues. It's going to come in large part through building the kinds of cities and neighborhoods that allow more people to drive less. 
buses are a justice issue because in so many U.S. cities, the majority of U.S. cities, if you have access to a private vehicle, you are afforded uh, the opportunity to get to the job you want. You're afforded the opportunity to reach parks and churches and your family and friends and everything you need to live a full life. Whereas if you don't have access to a private vehicle, your life is just that much smaller. This example is from New Orleans, but you could say the same thing about San Diego or Cincinnati or really almost every US city. Why is that? It's because public transportation in the US is just incredibly sparse. We have a scarcity problem. We don't run enough service that people can rely on. And the fastest way to change that is going to be running much more bus service to more places. When I look at these diagrams, I'm always so struck by how in US cities, the map of transit that comes at a reasonable frequency can look like a few strands of spaghetti on the map. Whereas in cities in Canada, a place that has land use very similar to the US, the frequent transit network, it looks like the map of Toronto, or it looks like a net, a safety net for folks who rely on transit. Because transit is so scarce in US cities, the majority of low income households uh, have cars and certainly even more aspire to own cars, even though car ownership uh, exacerbates financial precarity. And researchers that have looked at car ownership in low income families find that it's quite typical for families to go in and out of car ownership. One ticket or one repair and you know the car might be sold. Um, it really is a very unstable existence and levels of automobile debt are at the highest level in recorded US history. And yet many folks choose to do that because the alternative that we offer is so poor. Um, and so I wanna to return to another quote by uh, Professor Atto here that transit is not simply about getting to work. It actually is about participating in society in the fullest way, including in the democratic process. That was really underscored by a recent analysis from uh, Alex Karner from the University of Texas. This is a map of public transit access in Harris County, the county that includes Houston, Texas. If you wanted to get to the one uh, ballot drop box that had been opened in the 2020 election, uh, for much of the county, it would take you more than an hour to get there on transit. And for still more of the county, there's no way at all to get to that ballot drop box. And this is the case, you know, not just in national elections, but it plays out in local decision making as well. Sometimes decisions about how we plan transit itself are very difficult for actual transit riders to get to. The meeting might be at a time when the bus stops running or in a place where the only transit route that goes there goes there once an hour. Transit is a justice issue and this, um, you know, this lens becomes even more important in the pandemic that we are in. More than a third of transit riders work, transit commuters work in essential industries. And so even for those of us who may have the privilege to work from home or those of us who don't ride transit regularly, transit is essential because it is keeping our healthcare systems and our food systems and our utility systems and all the other systems that have kept society going in this time, it's keeping them going, it's getting folks to and from work. And that is a workforce that in the course of the pandemic has become plurality, black, majority, people of color, and the same populations who are being disproportionately affected by the coronavirus.
And so we have to build power for transit. We actually have to build power for the right kinds of transit investments. One of the things that has uh, vexed me over the course of my uh, career in transit planning, I, I find this simultaneously heartening and frustrating, is that we actually know everything we need to know about how to make buses great and convenient for people. We know that people choose transit and we know that people choose the bus when the service comes frequently enough that you don't have to build your life around the schedule. We know that it comes when the service is fast, when you can rely on it, when the schedule is an ironclad promise. We know that people will choose transit when the walk to and from the service uh, is easy, is safe, and leads you to a dignified experience. So having a shelter that protects you from the weather, for example, being uh, free from uh, harassment on board, having a polite uh, customer service staff. We know that people choose transit when it gets them where they want to go and when they can afford the fare. Uh, and there's, you know, in the book, I, I cite dozens of studies underpinning all of these, but these are all features that anyone who rides the bus on a regular basis sort of feels in their bones. We know all this, and yet we don't have it. That has a lot to do with how transit riders, how bus riders, are marginalized even within the politics of transit itself. Many of us in the planning field and in the transit field are taught that we can think of transit riders in two categories. That people who own cars, you know, they're they're often um, labeled using this term choice riders. You know, they have a car, so they have a choice, and that means as a transit agency, we have to work extra hard to get them. And we can do that by building, uh, we can do that by building rail, by building park and rides, by building in a lot of amenities into the transit service like Wi-Fi and good branding and comfortable seats. And meanwhile, everyone else, you know, especially most bus riders, you know, who don't own cars, they don't really have a choice. So they're just going to use transit no matter what. And the term of art for that is captive riders. You know, the, the term itself implies that people are captive to transit. That is not the reality. And in fact, there's there are numerous studies, um, some which I've been involved in, uh, other studies from you know, the Mineta Transportation Institute, which show that everyone has a choice. Some of those choices might not be ideal. Those choices might be getting a ride with friends. They might be choosing to walk three or four miles to work. Um, and ultimately, they might be that choice that I talked about earlier, buying uh, buying a car, even though it's difficult to afford. <clears throat> but we have to treat everyone as if they have choice because they do. Um, and that means having less focus on mega projects that take years to construct and are aimed at areas where there's not a lot of transit riders it means focusing more on the types of incremental improvements that improve current riders' lives and doing it at scale. So for example, you know, a lot of what it takes to give buses priority on, on the street, it's much cheaper than many of the mega projects we talk about. The real issue is political will, not cost. We know that places that have redesigned their bus networks to put much more emphasis on frequent service. Austin, Texas, for example, that we do see transformative impacts. We know that when we create that dignified experience, when we have shelters, there's really good research from the University of Utah showing that uh, when UTA did this, added bus, shop, uh, bus stops and uh, ADA accessibility improvements, the stops where those improvements were added, ridership grew almost twice as fast than at comparable stops without the improvements. And they stemmed growth in paratransit, implying that riders with disabilities were choosing the fixed route bus system. And so we have to build the kinds of agencies that can do that at scale. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later. This is not a skill set that we have built into the public sector in a lot of places, but being able to do those small improvements all 
over the place is, uh, is the way we're going to really improve bus riders' lives. Um, a lot of this, you know, the, the state of transit today has to do with lack of power held by transit riders. And so reversing it requires building power inside and outside of government. Um, we see the consequences at the local level quite often when, when we try to improve buses. Opposition to them is expressed by homeowners or local businesses. And it's often done in the most classist and racist terms. This is a very typical of someone's experience at a public meeting about improving bus service. We see it at higher levels of government where the federal transportation program gives the lion's share of funding to highway programs and where state departments of transportation often have carte blanche to build or expand a highway, whereas expanding transit is something that local voters have to approve. That's an enormous structural difference in the politics of major projects. And so everywhere I have seen a major transit reform, it has happened through building power inside and outside of government. In other words, it takes both movements and heroic bureaucrats inside government who are willing to work with movements either in coordination or at least in concert. So I want to talk about uh, a few different examples of how that can work. Uh, in Indianapolis in 2016, um, there's really an unprecedented uh, transit tax victory. Indianapolis voters agreed to raise their own income tax to greatly improve bus service. It was the first referendum to raise taxes for a non-education service in Indiana history. It happened after years of failure on the part of business leaders who had wanted better transit. For years, they had been campaigning for uh, a regional transit agency. They had been campaigning for a light rail line to the airport. What was different about 2016 was that the coalition grew to encompass faith-based activists, racial justice activists, groups organizing in black and brown neighborhoods. And they were organizing in support of a much different plan, a plan that wasn't focused around one um, transformative uh, investment or one mega project. It was a plan that was focused on expanding transit everywhere. On the left was the, uh, is a, a map of the bus system in Indianapolis. Uh, every red line is a route arriving at least every 15 minutes, and you can see that there are only a couple. The map on the right is the service funded by this tax increase, a dramatic increase of access to frequent transit. And so the coalition didn't talk solely about economic development or about making Indianapolis a quote unquote world-class city. They talked about the fact that Indianapolis businesses couldn't access workforce. They talked about the fact that the city was not a fair or competitive place to be. Uh, Faith-based organizations even expanded the picture and talked about the fact that poor transit access was part of the same problem as mass incarceration and poor uh, voting rights. It was all part of the same suffocation of communities of color. And so it had to change. Um, as for the transit agencies part, remember this is a story about, it, about working inside and outside government. Agencies can't advocate for themselves in the same way. However, the agency was able to put out a lot of information, um, ostensibly neutral information, but information which could very easily be used by organizers. Uh, and so, and very often when the transit agency would have a public meeting, they would have one of their board members present after them. That board member happened to be uh, Mark Fisher, uh, an executive at the, at the Chamber of Commerce. And as a board member, he could talk about in using values, could talk about why transit was important and why attendees should vote yes. <laughs> 
the example in Indianapolis is just one part of a broader trend um, that we see in the transportation political science literature and the transportation political reality, which is that you know, we often think that urban policy is, um, is done at the whim of real estate, uh, business groups, other elites, but at least when it comes to transit, those interests are no longer enough. They cannot dictate transit policy. Instead, in uh, Clayton County, Georgia, as uh, this paper by Alex Carner and Richard Duckworth shows, uh, and in Indianapolis and in Seattle and in many, and in many other places, what we see is that the transit campaigns win when the coalition includes groups that are responsive to and can mobilize transit riders and the communities that need transit the most. So those are a couple of stories about um, building power for funding. What about building power inside agencies themselves so that we can deliver the projects we need at scale? Um, transit agencies in the US, like many other public agencies as, as we're seeing, have been hollowed out. Um, in many cases, transportation agencies have difficulty implementing projects quickly. Uh, public engagement is done in ways that are not representative of those who ride. Uh, even sometimes agencies have difficulty communicating the value of the product that they provide. Um, and that is an issue of having sufficient staff, of having the political leeway to be able to communicate clearly, uh, sometimes even agency culture. In the course of researching the book um, and in the work that I do daily at Transit Center, um, I, I talk to a lot of transportation leaders who, and a lot of transportation advocates who are working to reverse this and rebuild capacity in the public sector. Uh, here are a couple of examples of how that plays out. In bus planning, one of the things that I, that I found most frustrating and that has been changing a lot in recent years is that many bus lane projects were planned in a way almost as if they were a large highway project or a mega project. Even a three or four mile bus lane project would involve a conceptual design stage and a 30% design stage and a full design stage and a series of four or five public meetings at every stage, which created multiple opportunities for opponents of the project to object, to veto the project. Um, this is the link. Th these links are from the website of the 16th Street Northwest Bus Lanes Project in Washington, DC. You'll see that the first study is from February 2009. And this project is actually not completed yet. So it's been 11 years and counting. What does that mean for the, the, the power dynamics there? It means that it's, it's actually really hard to engage the folks who the project is supposed to benefit. Um, a lot of bus riders are not gonna be living in the same place or riding the same bus in three or five, or in this case, 11 years. And what the drawn out process does instead is make it really easy for the privileged stakeholders who have the ability to go to all the public meetings uh, to, to dominate, and that drives the press narrative as well. So what many agencies have started doing instead is embrace sort of the tenets of tactical urbanism. Uh, use, put down temporary lanes with paint or cones, uh, survey, riders on board the bus and uh, the surrounding communities uh, to, to demonstrate the impact. One of the things that's really great about this process is that you get supportive data right away. This example uh, is from the Washington Street bus lane in, in the Boston region. Uh, what is being shown here is that is that the bus became much more reliable. Really the issue in this corridor was not the average speed, it was the fact that on a bad day, uh, someone on the bus would be delayed by 12, you know, 13 minutes and having the tactical bus lane made it a much more reliable and predictable experience. Rather than waiting, than asking folks to go through a five-year process, this process allowed people to experience 
the benefits immediately. It also created an intense but short-term opportunity for advocacy groups like the Livable Streets Alliance, which is a, a Boston-based nonprofit, to organize bus riders in the corridor. It makes a huge difference when, you know, it's really different as a public agency to ask nonprofit uh, advocacy groups to sign up for, you know, five years of meetings versus a few weeks of driving support for a project. And so here's what that means in terms of the power dynamics. It just, this is an example of a public process that creates momentum instead of a feeling of siege. And it's an approach that is particularly appropriate in places where um, there are a lot of bus riders already, um, but it's perhaps in a, um, in a middle income or wealthier area, this allows everyone, this allows everyone to see the benefits quickly and it allows area stakeholders to see that, you know, this, we put the bus lane in and the sky didn't fall. Um, other examples in terms of building state capacity. In most cities in the US, there's not a single person in city government whose job it is to make transit better. What happened in Boston after they saw the success of some of these tactical lanes was they hired their first ever uh, transit team uh, so that they could continue to roll out tactical transit projects. And over the last year, they've delivered 14 miles of bus lanes. Uh, conversely, transit, conversely, um, I always think about this as a counterpart, King County Metro, the uh, main bus agency in the Seattle area, they recognize that many of the small cities and towns outside of Seattle really didn't have the in-house capacity to understand how changing the traffic like traffic light uh, timing or changing the, some intersection designs could shave seconds or minutes off of bus routes. So they built an internal traffic engineering unit, something that's very rare in the transit field that can make house calls to all the small municipalities and make the case for street improvements. The municipalities control the money, but the transit agency can provide the assistance and make the case for it. It becomes something like a regional center of excellence. Um, last example I want to, to talk about here um, comes from the Better Bus Stops uh, program uh, in the Twin Cities in, uh, in Minnesota. The agency was awarded a federal grant and it, and it used that grant to uh, improve bus shelters in racially concentrated areas of poverty. And they knew that they needed to get a lot of input from riders about what people valued in bus shelters, what were the community assets where people thought a shelter was most appropriate, as well as you know, how they wanted to, to know how effectively does the agency you know, cite shelters today. And so what they did, which was unusual, was they actually routed the public engagement through about a dozen community-based organizations. And these ranged from uh, groups that represented, for example, older people in high-rise uh, housing complexes to uh, neighborhood-based organizations, uh, organizations that represented certain uh, ethnic enclaves. Um, by going through these community-based organizations, the groups were able to do outreach in a way that was uh, context-sensitive, that was culturally competent. One sort of proof of that was that the agency put out a survey and the survey results were representative of bus riders in terms of race, ethnicity, income. They engaged hundreds of riders with disabilities. And by doing that, they learned really important things. They learned, for example, that they had to stop and their insistence, you know, they, they were really motivated. They thought that you know, if we're gonna put a bus shelter somewhere, it should always be the largest shelter because that's the biggest amenity for riders. But what they found actually is that in many cases, they were placing shelters in a way that really reduced the accessibility for uh, folks using wheelchairs. They also learned that for older riders, seating 
uh, seating was immensely important. They, they heard from many older riders that they were actually willing to walk up to a quarter of a mile. The barrier to transit in that case was not the walk itself, but the fact that there was nowhere to sit at the end of the walk, and that was what was blocking people from transit. Um, and so I want to, um, you know, in this last section, uh, talk a bit about some of the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, facing transit reformers across the US. Um, the first is that in our most prosperous cities and in this, our cities that are growing the fastest, we're also seeing immense displacement that the most loyal transit riders are being pushed to places where transit is the least able to serve them. Uh, this comes from an analysis done by a couple of planners at TriMet. Um, the, uh, it might be a little difficult to see on these maps, but the decline in ridership correlated uh, quite a lot with where housing value increased the most. And so we have to build nimble transit agencies that can uh, that can reroute and redesign service to respond to this, but it's also much more than transit agencies can respond to on their own. And so what that means is for folks working within transit agencies and for transportation advocates, we have to begin working closer and closer with the agencies and the advocates working on housing policy so that we don't have this displacement to begin with. We're in the midst of a pandemic and we're in the midst of an enormous financial crisis for transit. In the largest transit regions, uh, federal relief that came through the CARES Act earlier this year, they've already burned through it. And so we're seeing um, in places like Denver and New York and Washington DC, proposals to slash 40 to 50 percent of service. The, the types of cuts that will make it incredibly difficult for riders today and incredibly difficult for economic recovery tomorrow. This is a real echo of what happened during the Great Recession 10 years ago, where, um, where we saw cuts of 25 to 40 percent and service was not restored to pre-recession levels for five or six years. In some cases, wasn't restored until eight or nine years. On the other hand, we have kind of interesting and um, very compelling opportunities. The new administration frames transit as a climate issue, and it also frames transit as as a moral minimum, it, it states that every American city deserves high quality public transit. That is not a framing that we've seen from the federal government in decades. Now, it's really not up to the president to make that happen, it's a congressional question. Um, folks who have done the analysis, like Yona Freemark at the Urban Institute, have found that if we changed the federal transit funding paradigm, if we got to an even split, we would have the money we need to provide great transit in every urban area. We could bring a uh, transit level of service uh, everywhere up to what it is in the Chicago metropolitan area. Um, and so I wanna uh, conclude by returning to the question uh, I started the presentation with you know, what is the place of public transportation in this frayed democracy? Should there be a moral minimum in its allocation? If there is one thing that I've learned in my career, and if there's one thing I hope you take away from this presentation, is that these questions will be resolved through the building of power inside and outside of government at every level of government.
So I want to thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, lots, uh, lots of things to discuss, and um, we already do have some good questions um, that have come in. And I want to encourage anyone who has additional questions or any questions, um, type them in. And um, I am going to go ahead and uh, start. Um, well, there was one quick one I think maybe we can take care of right now. In terms of getting a copy of your book, I believe it's Island Press is the publisher of your book. Yes, that's right. That's right. I so, Island Press and, um, you know, ask your local bookstores too. Um, great. Um, in no particular order, I'm going to um, start off with this question. Um, so, and it gets to your example of using a tactical approach. So some cities require hearings and things like that, just even for moving bus stops, um, even just down the block. The argument is that this is both civil rights and disability rights issue. So this sort of maybe is in contrast to the tactical transit planning um, approach. Um, any response to that or examples of, of how to approach those types of um, processes and how to get public input there? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that there's strong rationale for changing some of those policies. And I, and I don't mean just, you know, doing it straight away. I think a change like that would have to be discussed and negotiated with many groups working on civil rights. Um, but I think of, for example, um, and this is this is a slightly this is a slightly different process issue in Los Angeles um, is probably one of the places in the U.S. where it's the most difficult to cite bus shelters, which is different from bus stops. Um, the the city government there set up this process where every bus shelter in the city needs sign off from eight different agencies. And the local council member can block the siting of the shelter as well, um, which which gets to issues of you know this sort of like hyper local control. Um, you know what what I'm going to say is a little bit of a of a generalization, but I think in a lot of instances when processes are set up so that it's this sort of ultra local control those processes then get dominated by uh, the stakeholders who have the most access, whether that's a really influential business owner, whether it's a, um, you know, a homeowner who just happens to have a lot of time and resources, it's usually privileged stakeholders who win out. Um, and so I think it's, it's, I think it's really important that we not take those processes as a given, but we think about, changing them um changing them in ways that lead to more procedural equity um and so that and so that's not exactly a uh, a yes or no answer to the to the question but i'm saying that that these these processes aren't set in stone and changing them can have a lot to do with getting better transit outcomes great thank you Chris, do you have one? Okay, yeah, we have a, a question about, um, so the speaker talks about mega projects and assumes that, I assume that means public projects. Can you ask, well, what is about the role of private sector and what are cities doing, what cities are doing a good job of requiring better bus amenities as part of development and how can that advance uh, transportation equity in our cities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so two two big questions there. Um, when we speak about the when we speak about the private sector, the um, the private sector can certainly play a pretty important role in helping to deliver public projects. We just have to make we just have to recognize that you know we we can contract out some aspects of transit to the private sector. You know we can. We can hire a private company to provide some bus routes, or we can hire a private contractor to build a new rail station. 
but we cannot contract out the public interest. And what that means is inside our public agencies, we have to have really, really effective contract oversight and contract management functions. Otherwise, what we end up with is, um, you know, there's a, just a couple of pretty high profile uh, recent um, scandals. You know, the, the, the rail system that's being planned and developed in Honolulu is, is years and years behind schedule now, even though the project itself is a great project. It's, it's exactly in the right place. It's going to serve lots of people, but weak public oversight has led to just an incredible scandal. And it's a very similar story with uh, California high-speed rail. So, so this gets back to the need to have leaders who are really thinking about how to strengthen the public sector. We can't assume that you know we're just going to make every transit development project, a public-private partnership, and then the efficiency of the private sector is going to win out. What actually happens is that without a strong public sector, um, you know, you get you get private firms that'll that'll eat up all those all those cost overruns. Um, as to the second part of the question, I think it can be really important in a in a in kind of a um, almost a tactical sense for uh, public transit agencies to think about how they can work with um, you know, private businesses to uh, win, ex win acceptance of, of bus stops and place shelters. Sometimes shelters can be built into a new development, for example. Uh, it, I don't think it works as an overall strategy to think that we're going to get most of our shelters through these partnerships with uh, with private entities, it can it can be part of it, um, but I would say overall is that we need a strong public commitment to transit through you know broad based funding sources, and then we have to use some of that funding to build up the internal capacity to to manage you know whatever private entities are working with transit. Great. So we have we have a lot of good questions here. Hopefully we can get to most of them. Um, what recommendations do you have for navigating improvements in systems that span multiple jurisdictions? So you can imagine some systems that have a number of smaller neighboring uh, municipalities and a larger regional transit authority, or even multiple transit systems. You know, I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. It definitely is an issue there. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that we need uh, we need more and stronger regional governance, and barring that, we need more semi-formal and, and informal working groups among the different municipalities and transit agencies. Um, it's it's telling that you bring up the the bay area since it's one of the most um fragmented regions in the u.s in in the course of the pandemic the like the the dozens of transit agencies in the bay area have actually come together um pretty effectively in a few different working groups convened by the uh the the mpo the metropolitan planning organization there so so almost by necessity they're cooperating much more than they used to on uh, service decisions um, but you know we, ha we have to have that happen in in cases when it's not forced by the emergency of a pandemic where it is forced instead by the kind of everyday emergency of the insufficient transit we're providing to people uh, so so i would say that you have to counter the fragmentation by creating new spaces for collaboration. And those spaces can be very formal or they can be informal. And by informal, I mean, it, it can start by getting a few people who are really invested at the different transit agencies, just talking to each other on a regular basis and, and you know, trying to sort of organize from the inside to make it happen in a more formal way. Great. Um, 
can you think of some ways we could modify these strategies in low density and rural areas? For example, buses aren't stuck in traffic, but headways are hourly and there's small ridership. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, you know, some of what I talk about is applicable, uh, is applicable uh, everywhere. For example, I think the, the, the the question of whether transit is a dignified experience, I really think that we owe that to everyone and that um, we can make it a more dignified experience than it is today without a huge amount of capital investment. Um, and I think it may, it may still be the case that, um, that even in some rural areas that that um, you do have issues of of congestion, but um, you know, I think I think another way to think about it is to really think about the overall uh, convenience and ease of use of the customer experience in more rural areas that have that might have much more to do with providing good information about you know is the transit on schedule, uh, where is it. And it has a lot to do with that, um, that uh, the dignity of the experience. So, so I think that this real focus on user experience um, is true in both uh, congested urban areas and in more rural areas. But what that means, you know, it can be a little different depending on context. Great. So we had a couple questions come in about a recent effort in the Portland region to pass some new funding for transportation. And I, I know during your presentation, when you told the story um, about Indianapolis and what happened there, it got me thinking about the Portland experience. So um, I guess, first of all, maybe I, I don't know how much you followed it, how much uh, substantively you can uh, respond to these questions. Um, but um, any, I guess broadly on one of them is any, uh, because the effort did focus some on, on equity was part of uh, the campaign for support. And so any advice, uh, what advice would you give for cities who are trying to move big uh, funding measures like that forward? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, let's see, I, I have followed it somewhat. Uh, I haven't followed it too closely, so I'm a little worried that I'm in the situation where I know just enough to say something that turns out to be really misleading. But um, <laughs> but from my understanding, um, you know, su support for the referendum was fairly split among groups that work on transit and groups that work on equity, which is with you know and. I think that I think that that is true, which I think is a is a sign that even though it was uh, portrayed as um, as equity being a, a major component, maybe not everyone felt that uh, felt that overall it was an equitable investment. Um, you know, I know that on the from, from what I've read the the transit investments were sort of concentrated in 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 one area. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on a particular light rail extension, and, and I think that that does stand quite in contrast with some of the the winning uh, referenda elsewhere in the country, where there was much more of an emphasis on transit improvements throughout the service area. Um, so again, I'm not sure if I if I um, you know, if I framed all that correctly, but I but I think that one thing that's really important is equity. You know, whether whether the referendum is equitable is not about whether it is being communicated as equity. It's about whether groups that represent riders and communities of color believe that it is equitable and have had enough ability to actually shape the plan themselves. 
So maybe, I'm sure folks involved with it might have different opinions about whether that happened or not. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate um, your preface to that um, about, you know, your level of knowledge um, on the situation. And maybe, especially for people who aren't familiar with the transit center, and I should um, admit right now that I am a trustee on the board of the transit center. If you could just explain a little bit um, what types of roles the transit center plays in these types of initiatives for funding at um, local and regional levels. Yeah, so transit center works in a few different ways. We conduct research into transit and the politics of, of transit. We support uh, civic organizations that are fighting for better transit in their communities. And we also, um, we also work directly with uh, transit agency staff and in some cases provide technical assistance. When it comes to a referendum like this, um, we don't get involved with ballot initiatives, but we do research. Um, we have researched you know, multiple winning and, and losing uh, referenda around the country. And we also support, we, we support several uh, groups that have a role in referenda. We just, you know, we don't directly support uh, ballot work. Um, and so when I, when I say that um, it's really important to have these uh, broad coalitions that is informed uh, not just by the Indianapolis and the Clayton County examples that I cited, but also research we've done on a, a failed referendum in Nashville, on uh, ballot measures in Los Angeles, um, and in a few other places. Great, thanks. Um, a question came in earlier in your presentation um, that then you actually did address, but I, I wanna go back to it because um, there may be more that you want to say, and it's that issue of displacement. So oftentimes, so the original question was, you know, how do we prevent bus lanes and other transit improvements from raising property values and perhaps contributing to displacement? Mm -hmm. um, and you did, um, you did um, have at least one slide where you um, mentioned some anti-displacement strategies. But is there anything you would want to expand on that, or um, an example, or where you think it's a bigger problem mm -hmm. or a smaller problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that ra I, I'm not sure that we can stop transit improvements or any other public improvement from raising property values. What we have to do is try to stop the actual displacement from happening. And that should involve um, definitely a lot of the policies that were on the the menu from uh, professor uh, Karen uh, Chappelle that I that I noted um, but uh, a couple of examples that I think have been um, a couple of good examples from the from the transit world um, when the green line light rail was being was uh, being planned and built in uh, Minneapolis st. Paul there was um, there was a very large program that was funded both by uh, local foundations and also, and later by uh, the Federal um, Housing and Urban Development uh, Agency um, to build affordable housing around the rail line, but all, and also to provide uh, financial support and technical assistance to businesses uh, as the construction was happening. Um, in, in a lot of cases, these were, um, you know, these these were you know sort of ethnic businesses, and the technical assistance would take the forms, for example, of like helping them build uh, better websites uh, and 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 otherwise sort of um, uh, you know make make them more viable in a number of different ways that were that were driven by hearing from the businesses what they needed. Um, that's a very direct kind of support that doesn't happen very often. Uh, around, you know, the construction of these big projects, and I think that um, I don't want to say that 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 bus improvements uh, never lead to displacement, but these um, 
you know, lar large scale sort of bus rapid transit or light rail projects are, er are areas where we need a lot of support because the construction can be very disruptive. It makes it harder for businesses to survive for a number of years. And then there's a lot of displacement pressure when the project opens uh, and even in the years in, in the run up to it. So I think there is a need to try to focus resources around those big projects. All right, great. And we are we are at our time, um, and uh, we are actually were able to get through. I think all of the questions. Um, I want to um, thank uh, Stephen Higashide uh, for uh, the presentation today. And normally we would give you um, a round of applause, uh, and you would hear in, in the room at least. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have that. Um, and then I want to remind um, our audience uh, that right when you close out the screen, you're going to get a quick um, survey from us um, about uh, today's event, which um, we hope uh, you will fill out. And I want to remind you, if you haven't already, please sign up to get our newsletter and follow us on social media. Uh, so with that, I want to thank um, Stephen again. and. Um, Thank everyone who has joined us in this fall uh, term of our transportation seminar. And we are working on um, our Friday seminars uh, for the upcoming year. So stay tuned for those. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.